So Roslyn, you're a startup icon, the man behind arguably Australia's best known online retailer. How did it all begin? Well, I've been involved with quite a few businesses since the age of nine or ten, so I've always been wheeling and dealing and loving the business landscape. So uh, the first venture I did was selling golf balls, where I'd go and collect golf balls that golfers were too lazy to collect. I'd put them in, you know, clean them, put them in egg cartons and then take them back to the golf course at the weekend and uh, sell them back to the golfers at 50 cents a pop. So, um, you know, not huge money, not a huge business. It would make me about 20 or 30 bucks a weekend. But uh, as a 10 year old, that made you pimp of the milk bar. So uh, it was, a, you know, one of my first ventures. And then I'd run a lot of things since then, like a car wash business, a website design business, a mobile phone repair business. And, you know, Kogan's my baby now. It's the biggest thing I've ever done. It's my passion. It's what I love doing. And that all started with the rise of online retail. So I went to college in Miami to do my final semester. I saw the rise of online retail there. When I came back to Australia and I wanted to buy a TV, I saw these huge prices that the big stores were charging. So I started inquiring overseas. Uh, to see if I could import one from overseas and how much they cost. And then I saw this huge gap in the market. A TV that I could land in Australia for about $1,000 was selling for three or $4,000 in the big name stores. So then I researched it a bit further and I saw that the main component in a TV is the LCD panel. And there's only a handful of manufacturers that make it, Samsung, LG, Hitachi and Sharp. So no matter what brand TV you get, the core component is the same. Uh, so if you get a Sony TV, it uses a Sharp panel. If you get a Bang & Olufsen TV, it uses a Samsung panel. So when I saw that the products are very similar, but the price gap is huge, I said, well, you know, this would be a perfect business model for an online business because I saw the rise of online retail in Miami. So uh, yeah, then I quit my my day job which was working as a management consultant at Accenture and started Kogan. Everyone said I was crazy at the time because uh, online retail was unheard of back then. Nobody was uh, selling TVs online. We were the first place to sell TVs online in Australia. We were the first company to speak publicly about the benefits of online retail and you know it's been growth upon growth from there. People are smart consumers. They can look at two deals look at the specs, see that they're pretty much the same thing, and they're obviously going to go for the cheaper option when that's the case. So there's a similar principle to collecting the golf balls for lazy golfers, you're collecting electronics for lazy consumers. As such, because uh, it's pretty difficult for consumers to import one TV from overseas because of all the freight costs, logistics costs and all of that. Um, what, what it comes down to, the similarities between the golf balls and the TVs, is seeing an opportunity in the market, seeing a gap that exists and saying, well, hang on a second, I can add value there, I can do it better, I can do it more efficiently. And any time you add value in the marketplace, there's a business there, there's profit to be made, and there's a win-win scenario and relationship between you and your consumers. So you've taken that business from scratch seven years ago and turned it into $300 million revenue last financial year. How have you managed that growth? Look, growth is very difficult to manage, but uh, it's probably one of the better challenges in a business. I would rather have managing growth as a challenge than, you know, how do we survive or how do we find more customers as a challenge. So uh, it's a good challenge to have and a lot of things change. Uh, one of the main principles in our business and our internal philosophy is that there is always a better way. So management is always told to question everything. All of our staff are told to question everything, swim upstream, challenge the way we do things. And as a result of that, we're a much different business today to what we were a year ago. And a year ago, we're a different business to what we were two years ago. It's about constant innovation, looking at every single process in the business, every single thing we do in the business and saying, how can it be done better? And then implementing systems and processes around that. When the business started, our community may have had a few thousand people in it after the first year. It's much easier to communicate with a few thousand people and send emails than it is to now where we have over 1.5 million people in our community. 
the systems, the architecture, getting the deliverability of the emails, sales notifications, all of that on time is a much different proposition. So you have to constantly scale your business and build things for how you think your business is going to be in a year rather than building things for how your business is today. And despite that rapid growth, you've had some very frequent and vocal critics. How do you stay focused and headstrong while you're building your business when there's big industry players cutting you down at every turn? There have been a lot of critics along the way and a lot of people saying things like, you know, uh, online retail isn't great, you know, we need to focus on our bricks and mortar retailers and critics from everywhere. But there's only one critic that I care about in business and that is our customer. If we can please that critic, then our business is going to grow. Looking at some of your other business challenges, what else have you had to overcome? So a lot of business challenges come along as a result of growth and managing that growth. You've got you know, everything from, well, we used to need to send an email to a thousand people, now we need to send an email to one and a half million people every day. Uh, you know, so you've got your server architecture, your website stuff, all of that, which you need to scale and keep growing constantly. Then there's another one of even staffing and human resources, because running a team of five people is very different to running a team of over a hundred people and ensuring that you maintain the company culture. So, uh, you know, all, all of those things are equally as important, ensuring that every new staff member we recruit now is a sort of person who culturally will Google something as soon as they don't know an answer rather than ask to be sent on a training course. Someone who keeps up with the latest trends, the latest technology and all that sort of stuff. So every single department in the business uh, has its challenges associated with growth. So you've got over 100 staff now and a huge suite of products. What are the key policies and processes that you've got in place to ensure the business runs smoothly? Well, one of the key policies is to ensure we're frequently communicating with our customers because as we expand our business, it's very important that our customers are still happy, that we're doing exactly what our customers want us to do. If, you know, no matter how big Kogan gets, no matter how well we source products, manufacture products, sell products, no matter how good our website is, if you take the customers away from our business, we're left with nothing. So uh, we're constantly surveying, communicating, we're talking to our customers to ensure that they're happy and addressing all the issues that are making them not happy and expanding on the things that are making them happy. So if customer feedback is saying, you know, we, we love buying our phones from Kogan, the prices are great, and you know, you've got a great range of Android phones, we'll go and increase our range of Android phones. If the feedback from customers is, you know, oh, this product arrived damaged, we will look into, you know, is it a one-off scenario where a courier driver dropped one order and a product got damaged? or is there a systematic problem here? And we might inc improve the packaging or use a different courier company uh, to, to fulfill orders of that product. So constantly looking at you know, what's not going well and what is going well, and doing more of what's going well and fixing everything that's not going well. Because business is never gonna be perfect, but it's our responsibility to ensure that we keep every single customer happy. So do you give equal weighting to improving on positive feedback as you do addressing negative feedback? Definitely, definitely. Okay. Uh, it costs 12 times more to find a new customer than it does to keep an existing one. So our top priority in the business is to ensure that all existing customers are happy, to ensure that we, we service them accordingly, that they're happy with their ordering process, with the delivery times, with the packaging of the item and with the actual item. So that's a key priority in the business, ensuring that they're happy with all of that. Once we have all of that under control, that's when you look at building a business. We're not interested in making a bad business bigger. We're interested in ensuring that what we're doing is awesome and then growing on it. But you've got to start at the foundation. Okay. Now you've built a, an incredibly formidable online business. What tips do you have for small brick and mortar businesses trying to compete with online? My advice for any business, whether it's a bricks and mortar retailer or a gym or you know, a cafe, is identical. And that is 
what is your competitive advantage, work it out and then flaunt it. So the only reason a customer would ever come to your business over another business is because of your competitive advantage. So if your competitive advantage is having an awesome product, put all of your time, effort, resources and devotion into improving your product. If your competitive advantage is service, dedicate everything to ensuring that your service keeps getting better and better and better. If your competitive advantage is convenience, dedicate all your work on making uh, a shopping experience with you more convenient for your customer. So every business at its foundation has a clear competitive advantage. For a bricks and mortar retailer, they can't look at online retail and say, oh well, you know, we just need to have a store, or we just need to do what they're doing. Because online retailers are more efficient than a bricks and mortar retailer. A bricks and mortar retailer will never be able to compete with an online retailer on price. Not possible. So what they have to do is say, well, what is our competitive advantage over an online retailer? For instance, there's a tennis store in Melbourne with a tennis court and they employ actual tennis pros to work there. So you can go to the tennis store, you speak to the pros, you trial out various gear, you have a hit with them, you listen to their advice and then you can make a purchase. And I go there to buy all of my tennis gear because uh, I, I like that service, I like that advice, I like their competitive advantage. I know I can go online and buy the same stuff for half the price, but I'm not going to have the expert advice, I'm not going to have the service, I'm not going to have to, I'm not going to have the ability to have a hit first before I purchase that tennis racket. So they're flaunting their competitive advantage and they wouldn't even see online retail as a competitor. They're a service business providing a service that nobody can get online. And look at you know other great bricks and mortar retailers like Nespresso. Nespresso stores are absolutely packed. Why you walk in there, you smell the aroma of the coffee, you feel the Nespresso experience. You can't do that online. You can't create aroma and the coffee smell and the beautiful experience that a Nespresso store creates. Same with Apple stores. They're all packed. They've got more staff than they do customers in each store wearing a blue t-shirt. They're not trying to win customers based on being cheaper than anybody else. They're saying, come into our store for the awesome experience and the great advice. So they're flaunting their, uh, their competitive advantage. And on top of that, they have an awesome product. You know, their competitive advantage is their product. So if you walk into a JB Hi-Fi or a Harvey Norman these days, you've got the same guy standing there selling someone a toaster, then someone else a fridge, then someone else a microwave, someone else a TV. They're not an expert at any of those products. And each of those products has a brand and model number. I can Google it and find it cheaper online. On top of that, if you ask them about any of the products, they just read off the box. You know, does this product have this feature? Oh, one second, sir, and they'll read it off the box. That's a bit offensive. I know how to read. I don't need a customer service expert helping me read something off a box. So they need to flaunt their competitive advantage. Okay, what about looking at new online retailers where the sort of experience and service isn't as pronounced? What tips do you have there? The most important thing in establishing a new online retailer is saying, what is my competitive advantage going to be? If you're selling the same product that many other retailers are selling, uh, your main option is price. Can I engineer a business model in order to deliver a better price for my consumers? Um, the other one is convenience. They can say, well, here's my online retailer. Can I make it a more convenient shopping experience? Can we do really quick delivery? Or can we do, you know, what can we do to make it, make it more convenient? Mm -hmm. The other thing that's important to look at for a new online retailer is social proof. So one big advantage that bricks and mortar stores have is that when you walk into a store and you see a crowd of people lined up at the cash register, your brain is telling you, these people have researched this business, these people have made a decision to buy from here, I can trust this company. It's great social proof. It's why we choose a crowded cafe over an empty one all the time. Now online, you don't have that. A website can be a lonely place because um, you don't know how many people are currently on this site as well, you know, are others buying from here. So create a social proofing experience around your website or your brand. 
integrate Facebook, show the community aspect of the site, show people that others trust your brand, others trust your business, others have made purchases here. So social proofing is very important online. And is that what Kogan looks to achieve with the uh, updates of uh, someone in Adelaide just bought this phone? Exactly, yeah. So in the same way that when you walk into a store and you see lots of people at the cash register and um, you know that creates the social proof around the store because you know that these 50 people in front of me trust this store. We try and create that online. We have a live feed in the bottom left hand corner that pops up and says, you know, someone from Manly just purchased an iPad. Uh, people in your area are buying similar products to what you're looking at. And that's meant to tell the person, well, you know, Kogan is a trusted brand. Even while you're looking at this product, here are all the transactions currently going through similar to the transaction you're about to do and in your area and things like that. So that's part of our social proofing. We'll also tell people when a product is getting lots of views, it'll pop up on the product and say, you know, 843 people have looked at this product in the last day. So anything we can do to breach that gap, which is the main competitive advantage that bricks and mortar has over online retail. And are those sort of systems easy enough to implement in an online store? Uh, if it was easy, everyone would do it. So I'd say no. Okay. Um, you know, we're one of the only ones I know that that has stuff like that. IT is part of our core expertise in the business. It's something we'll never outsource. We're happy to outsource our cleaners and our lawyers and our bookkeepers, but everything that's core to our business, we never outsource. And we have a big IT team and we're constantly recruiting into that team. It's one of the most important teams in our business and they're constantly working on thinking of new and innovative ways to improve the user experience. Now you've come a, come a long way with Kogan, Ruslan. What's the future look like? Yeah, I wouldn't quite say we've come a long way with Kogan yet. I reckon we're just getting started. So, um, you know, if you look at our business compared to some of the other consumer electronics retailers in Australia, or even the size of the industry, we're just a small speck. There's a lot of growth still remaining. So, um, you know, we aim to be the biggest consumer electronics retailer in Australia uh, within four or five years. We aim to become a global household brand. So our ambitions are pretty massive. So if you compare like, yes, we've done very well with what we've done so far and we've never had any external investment. We've never had outside capital and the business started with zero dollars. So to get to where we have so far is a result of the amazing team we've got at Kogan, but there's still a long way to go and we're just getting started. And plenty more critics to shoot down, no doubt. That's it, but like I said, there's only one critic we care about and that's our customers. Absolutely, thanks a lot for your time, Rosalind. Cheers, thank you.